Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep. yep. All right. I apologise in advance for my accent. I'm uh, actually Australian. My wife's a New Zealander, hence why I live in New Zealand. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about variable speed bearings. Now, just I guess a little bit of background to start off. Um, who's seen one of these maps before? A cartogram. Okay, that isn't really what New Zealand looks like. What we've done is we've taken a map of New Zealand and we've scaled it based on where all the people are. Okay, um, who's heard of Auckland? Or Ackland? <laughs> okay, um, it's got a laser pointer on here? Yeah. Okay, that's all of Auckland, biggest city in the country. Christchurch, second biggest city. Wellington, it's where all our politicians are. It's also on a fault line, so maybe one day we'll have a great earthquake and we'll all be better off with no politicians. Okay, Hamilton, the fourth biggest city. Tauranga over here, fifth biggest city, and it's all downhill from there. Um, what I'll do is I'll point out Hamilton's right in the middle of the North Island. Within an hour and a half or 150 kilometres or say 100 miles from Hamilton is over 40% of New Zealand's energy is both generated and consumed. It's about 50-60% of GDP is all uh, generated in what we call the Golden Triangle from Auckland down to Hamilton across to Tauranga. It's where all of the industry is. Okay, now I'm based at the University of Waikato. I don't really work for the university as such. We just happen to pay them a, a huge chunk of the money we earn each year to uh, have the pleasure of being able to be located there. What I do there is I run a part of the energy research group. I'm responsible for the industrial energy efficiency division. I know that's a mouthful. In essence, what we do is we help all of the, we work with all the companies in New Zealand that are all the big energy users. So we have a, a forum or group that are called the Large Energy Users Forum. So that's everyone from pulp and paper, dairy processing, um, aluminium smelter, steel mill, refinery mill, that sort of thing. Um, work on a range of products, also do a lot of consulting work both uh, domestically and internationally on a whole big long list of industries. Um, this program isn't in your, your uh, disk drive, but uh, if anyone wants a copy, we can organise that. I'll have to sanitise this. There's a few slides that I can't give you for commercial reasons, but um, beyond my control, I'm sorry, but we can, we can sort that all out. In general, if it's anything to do with the use of energy industrially, um, we're involved with it. Um, we don't tend to do a lot domestically with residential people. The reason for it is it's quite diffuse. And as you know, we've talked this week about how hard it is to get people in business to make decisions. You go domestically, it's even worse because every individual has their own feelings and beliefs and everything else. And as you know, no one but yourself is irrational. Or, no, oh, sorry, you're the only rational individual who know everyone else is irrational. You've got no idea what they're doing. Um, so yeah, so we stick to the industrial side of things. Okay, we do everything um, from sort of both numerical modelling, um, a whole range and suite of uh, numerical software tools, economic modelling, experimental work as well, both plant and laboratory scale. Um, and also get heavily involved nowadays with a lot of capital projects and implementation from a, um, analysis, design, implementation, project management, but also the back end, the verification stage. What's becoming really critical these days is, okay, you've done the project, you've promised to do all of this, let's actually then go on and document it to make sure that you've actually delivered what you promised. Um, just as a really good example, uh, a good friend of mine that uh, manages the company that I'm going to, or the, the, the site that I'm going to talk a little bit about today, he uh, made the comment, if he added up the total promised savings of the last 10 years of CapEx projects, now if I say CapEx, do you all understand what I mean by CapEx? Capital expenditure, okay? We, we abbreviate it down in New Zealand to just CapEx. It's a lot easier, but um, so capital expenditure projects, you added up all of the savings that were promised in the last 10 years for his site, that site would be producing, um, I think, half a million tonnes of milk powder a year, plus exporting steam and electricity to the national grid. You know, if you added up the savings that were promised. Um, and so this is a real big issue. What I'm going to talk about today is, I guess, to start with the project rationale, I'm going to introduce you to uh, New Zealand's uh, biggest company, Fonterra. Um, I'm going to talk about a few applications. Then we're going to talk about a few definitions on what we're going to do, um, some laboratory testing that we've done, then how we're rolling that out at the moment in plant, then talk about a few conclusions. Okay, now, I guess to start off with, just a little bit of background. Who here has heard of Fonterra? 
Only a few of you. Now, can anyone tell me how many individual product lines are there globally that you can buy off the supermarket shelf or grocery store shelf? Nope. There's only about 40 to 50,000 lines. Okay. Out of those, Fonterra's ingredients are in 14,000 of them. Okay. I want, to, want you to think about this for a minute. A couple more statistics. Fonterra is responsible for about 2.5% of the global dairy production. However, they control 35% of the global trade in dairy commodities. How would you like to only be responsible for 2% of your market but control 35% of the global trade? They're, they're a big player globally. They're New Zealand's biggest company but quite some way. And thankfully, I'm proud to say they are 100% New Zealand owned. The farmers own it. So 100% farmer owned cooperative. Um, 27 sites up and down the country and they produce a truckload of dairy products. Now what's interesting about the New Zealand industry is the cows in New Zealand are only fed on grass. Okay, which means we follow a grass curve because grass doesn't grow evenly all through the year. And so what happens is we have about a six to eight week period where production peaks and then it drops off. So a lot of those factories are running at peak okay, for about six to eight weeks and then it drops off. At peak production, they've got about 15 minutes spare capacity each day across the country. So do you think reliability is a big deal? Okay, it's a big deal. The other thing is, is they don't have enough capacity on site to store milk. They can only store it for so long. And then very quickly, the tankers that come to site, they become temporary storage silos. And that can only last so long. So reliability is a big, big issue. Okay, now... What's interesting about the, uh, the dairy plants is just about every motor without fail on their site is fitted with a VSD. And so variable speed applications are a big deal for Fonterra. None of their motors are sort of running um, just straight direct online or, or even through a soft starter. They've all got a VSD fixed. Now what happens is they may have some fixed speed applications that's running through a VSD but it may be fixed speed at whatever speed it may well be and then others that are going up and down. And so the, uh, the big, dish, big issue with uh, Fonterra is, okay, we want to we wanna monitor our bearings. But as you know, with vibration and everything else, how can we trend something when we don't know what the speed's doing and how's that going to impact on things? And so we got talking with them and talking with Gary and Doug and said, hey, you know, what can we do? And they so said, well, not much information available. So us being us, we said, well, we're going to do something about it. So what we did is we... Um, we set this thing up. Now, I guess I've got a few slides here telling you a little bit more about the factory. I'm going to skip through them. Seven and a half million litres a day. Can you imagine that? Now, the scary thing is on site, they've only got, there's the site there. There's three silos there. Let's see if I can, uh, these three silos here. I think they're better shown on the next slide. There you go. They've got storage for three million litres of milk. Okay. If they get a problem, they've got enough time to start sending milk to other factories down the road. Okay, They don't have very long at all. And the farmers, remember I mentioned the company's owned by the farmers? They don't like seeing their milk go down the drain. Okay, So these plants got to keep going. Very quickly, these mobile tankers become temporary storage silos. Bad news. Okay, a bit of history about the site. They've got um, four dryers. Goes back to 1967, so they've got some old equipment some relative new gear as well, and they're continually upgrading. They make skim milk powder, whole milk powder, various cream products as well. Now, as I said, the key question they had was, okay, variable speed applications. The first question was this. How does the speed impact the condition monitoring the bearings? Now, before I go any further, anyone want to answer that question? How is speed going to impact on our condition monitoring of a bearing? Significantly. Significantly? What's going to change? What's changing? The friction level. The friction level? Okay. Okay, which is going to, as, which comes down to what Mark said, effectively our dB is going to vary, right? Now, does that mean we can't do it? All that does is that just introduces another variable that we're going to take into account, right? So the next question then becomes, now if you think back to your level one, 
What do we talk about? Our acceptance stand of our test. If we're going to do a test and every time we go up to measure that bearing, what are we doing? Well, we're doing a test, aren't we? We are conducting a test. Same conditions. Okay. And so what we've got to be aware of is the variable. So all we're doing is increasing an additional variable. Okay. Now the next question is as well, okay, we're going to have to vary our acceptance standard a little bit, right? Okay. Now we're going to come back to this. So when we're looking at setting up some tests, we said, well, okay, what are our variables? Well, what are our standard variables first before we talk about a variable bearing? Now, Chuck's already done this to death today, so we don't need to cover this too, too much. What, what are the variables we're looking at when we test a bearing? Speed. We're not worrying about speed. Forget about speed for a minute. Alignment. Okay. Okay, but how do we measure that with the ultrasound? What are we measuring? All we're doing is we're measuring the dB, and we're listening to the sound, right? Okay, we then might record the sound file, then we might interrogate it. Okay, but that's all we're doing, right? Okay, now all we're going to do is we're going to add just one extra variable, the speed. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go through, um, we're going we're to give you some examples in a minute. What we did is we did some tests to say, well, okay, how much does that response from that bearing vary as we vary the speed? Okay. Because remember, how do we decide what's our acceptance standard that that bearing needs to be lubricated? What's our acceptance standard? 8 dB. 8 dB, or, or we might set it at 10. And now with the new system, with our new DMS, what's the other acceptance standard we're worrying about? What's our other alarm level? We used to be locked into 16 or 20, right? But now we can set that, okay? All right, so now what we've got is we've got two independent acceptance standards or, or alarm levels that we can play with, right? So the question we're trying to answer today is, okay, how much do I need to worry about my baseline? Okay. What am I going to do to set my acceptance standard for the lubrication? And what is my acceptance standard or, or test or alarm for sort of more than that where we're starting to get, get failure. Okay, now remember that when we get to that second alarm level, does that mean that bearing's going to fail? Okay, it means we've got some time, right? Okay. So none of those things have changed. Now remember, I, I, um, for those of you that have heard me speak before, you'll know that I like to be quite practical. I'm looking for a traffic light signal. I'm not looking for the detailed analysis to sort of complicate the job. I'm all about trying to make the job as easy as possible. Because I can tell you, the guys we deal with in the plants, they want things to be simple. If it's not simple, it ain't going to happen. It's as simple as that, right? Yeah? Is that true? Okay. So it's the same over here. Okay. Right. So what we did is there's a nice flash picture of our brand spanking new laboratory building at the university. Remember I said we pay the university a whole lot of money? One of the benefits is that is we get to use the facilities. Okay, what we did is we set up a number of test rigs. We have a smart pump. Anyone that's interested, I'll explain how it's smart later. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail now. A pulp screen. A water flume. Now, my good friend at the back here, when I said flume, he looked at me funny and said, what the heck is that? Okay, and I say flume. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? It's all right, we'll show you a picture in a minute. Okay, and then an air heater fan, so just a fan. Okay, here's our smart pump. What we've got in simple terms, motor here, pump, and that's just sucking water through this tank and up through a loop and back around. Now we could... Sorry, sorry? We got over there too. Oh yeah, and it's up over there. Yeah? Okay, sorry. Okay, so pump, so water's just being drawn in the tank and circulated back around. Okay, now obviously, following on from Chuck's and the climature, We've got our four bearings. I won't take any more time on that. Just to give you the numbers, this particular motor was a 25 kilowatt motor. Full speed was 1475 RPM. Now for this particular test, because of the spec of the motor and everything else, um, we didn't need to run the motor up that high. So what we did is we took some speed, measured the dB. Then we changed the speed again, measured the dB. So what you've got there is you've got in the red 
are the pump and the blue is the motor. Now anyone, what do we see there? Okay. Now if you look at the, uh, the blue, the motor, we've got about 5, 6 dB variation in the motor bearings across a fairly wide speed range, right? In practice, out on the plant, how much do you think your speed on your pump's going to change? Sorry? In most VSD applications, I can guarantee you that it's going to be predominantly 80, 90% of the time in a fairly narrow speed band. Okay. Now what we did here, because we were trying to test the limits in the laboratory, we went as low as we could, right through to as high as we could. And the reason we did that is, well, we wanted to test the limits. Okay. We could only go so high before the pump starts to cavitate and everything else. We had to back it, then, then back it off, obviously. We didn't want sort of cavitation sort of ruining, ruining the test. Now you'll see that when we go to the pump, okay, which is the red curve, you see it's got a little bit of a hump in it. So there we sort of hit the street spot. Now that's a function also of the loop that the pump's pumping the water around. There's a whole lot of other variables involved there. But So what you can see, if you're in the sweet spot here, we've got not a lot of variation, have we? Could we trend that quite comfortably? Okay. Now remember, worst case scenario, we've got maybe a 10 dB variation from low to high. Okay. So we've now got a couple of scenarios that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, hang on, I'm sorry, I went backwards. Okay, this is a pulp screen. Who knows what a pulp screen does? Screen's pulp, okay. <laughs> I asked for that, I guess. <laughs> okay. It's, it's effectively a strainer. It's, it's, it's basically you've got an XEP side and a reject side. You're wanting to get the pulp that's already at the size you want it and then you recirculate the other stuff, bang it through the masher or whatever, whether it's a chemical or mechanical pulping process to then sort of get it to the desired consistency, so then away you go. So in essence, it's kind of a fancy pump with a basket to sort of screen things out. Um, so what you've got, for those of you that are not familiar here, um, the, the little grey cylinder thing there in the front with Beloit written on it, the uh, company Beloit, they went bust, they uh, supplied a pulp mill to the Indonesians a few years ago, they didn't pay brought the company down. Just like that. Anyway, that's a story for another day. So I've got the motor in the back there, and this is just circulating pulp through. Okay. Oh, hang on. Okay, so we've got our uh, motor there, and then the, uh, the drive shaft running through to the screen at the back. So same scenario again. Now I think from memory this is 15 kilowatt. Okay. Quite a bit faster, 2900 RPM. Anything different with these results? What are we seeing now? Sorry? What's tightening up? Well, hang on. Let's, let's differentiate here for a minute. Okay. Remember the blue ones were which ones? The motor. So let's just stop and think about the motor for a minute. What can we see from on the motor? It's pretty flat, right? Now once again, you can just about guarantee that this low end point, do you think it's going to run down there? No. Is it running up here? No. Okay, so sort of somewhere in here, which it's normally running, it's actually pretty <laughs> flat, right? Yeah. Okay, now let's look at the, uh, the pump side, or, or it's actually the screen. Okay, but just to keep the terminology consistent, what have we got there? Five decibels in the sweet spot. Maybe six? Well, I, I, I'd call it closer to maybe ten, but but you got a bit up and down in there. And the rate of change. So. Yeah, maybe 10. Right. Because see, the problem is, is where we've got the extra measurements, that's where it typically operates. Okay, you've got this nice flat bit here, sure. Right. Okay. But see, this is where it's going to vary from application to application. Can you see a common theme coming through here? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to end up with is you can see that the motor tends to be relatively flat. Where the driven end, be it the pump, the fan, the screen, whatever it is, okay, that's going to vary depending on the application. And it's going to vary most importantly on where you're running, okay, what your plant's doing. Because guess what? 
where that particular screen there is running is going to be a function of what it's hooked up to. You could take the same screen, put it in over here in a different part of the plant, and because it's hooked up to something a little bit different, it may have a slightly different response. Okay. But remember, uh, yeah. Are those more decimal readings for your Yeah, um, yeah, it was just it was really good contact and getting plenty of noise. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, they're okay. I mean, um, As, uh, thing is, uh, are those acceptable decibel readings for your pump? They're okay. I mean, given what you have to appreciate here, that is a test rig that's not running continuously as well. It hasn't been all that well maintained, um, so it's probably a little bit higher than it should be, you know, if that was running 24-7 in a plant. But once again, though, remember that these tests were all done at the same time, so the condition of the bearing hasn't changed in the time we did this test. Okay, so we've, we've done that deliberately. Okay, I mean... When we do these tests, it's the only time this thing's running, okay? So it's not like this is, you know, if we go back next week, um, you know, and that was three months down the track, that thing hasn't done three months' work in the mill, okay? So it's sort of being in the, in the laboratory environment, all those sort of things become irrelevant. And, and remember, the dB scale is a relative thing anyway, right? It all depends on your reference frame. So, yeah, so don't, don't be worried too much about the absolute dB levels in any of these graphs, Okay. All right. So is everyone happy with that so far? Yeah. Yep, okay. Remember I said the water flume? Um, what we do at, at the university, um, we, we've done a few tests over the years on um, distributed generation. Who's heard that term before? Distributed generation? No, nobody? What? Okay, what is it, Gary? Enlighten everyone. I've just heard it. You've, you've heard it? Okay. Generating from several places. Okay. Um, you know how, you know the whole talk about climate change and everything else, and if you believe the doomsayers, you know, it's only going to be a matter of time, we're going back to the horse and cart, you know, we're going to live in all these little rural communities, and we're going to have the, the, the water drain, the creek out the back, we're going to have to have a little, a little turbine in that to generate electricity, right, because we can't burn coal anymore. Okay, well, distributed generation, what it's about is saying, hey, look, instead of having a big coal-fired power station 300 miles down the road, we're going to have a tiny little micro hydro term, um, you know, um, power station or something just locally, and we're just going to feed four or five houses off that. You know, so distributed means the generation's where it's being used. So what we do is we test that thing in a rig like this. We might have different blade designs, that sort of thing, and so we can change things. We can vary the speed. So what we have is this thing here is just effectively a propeller of sorts that's rotating water. Okay, so it goes through the return line down the bottom there and then just comes through and we can vary that. Obviously that's fixed to a VSD. So what we have is you've got the motor here running across a pulley and there's a single cantilevered bearing down with the pulley on a shaft. Okay, so we've got the, uh, the motor side. Now you'll notice on the pump end we only had a single bearing. Okay, same scenario though. Tiny motor, 4 kilowatts. Maximum RPM 960. Remember this was sort of a fairly large prop but very low speed. Remember, because we're wanting to test, we don't want a huge amount of turbulence, so it's all about sort of low speed application. What do you think of that? Yeah, pretty slick. Okay, look at the variation on that pump bearing with speed. Look at the motor. Okay, do you think we could trend that? We'll need to worry about what the speed is. Okay, here's another one. This is a fan blowing air through uh, a model air heater that we have. Same thing again. A couple of bearings on the motor. The, the, the fan's bolted pretty much straight onto the back end of the motor there on the inside of the duct. Four kilowatt motor again. 1440 odd RPM. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, we've only had the motor bearings. What about this one? What do you think? Okay. We're going to need to worry too much about speed there on the motor. Okay. Now, granted, we've got a little bit of noise in there, right? Okay. Now, before I go any further, how can we accommodate for a few dB in this noise level? What do you think we can do? What's the... What's the, what's the I mean, we could go down the technical path and we'd say, look, we're going to have to measure that speed and go back and check how our baseline is going to be a curve instead of just a single point. You know, we could go down that path. Okay. What's the alternative path? 
Yep, okay. Now, the question is, is, well, okay, how do we determine what those alarm points should be? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. Well, before we do that, just a quick summary. Okay, number one, the variable speed had little effect on the dB level of the motor bearings tested, okay, especially across the frequency range of interest for the, each application. Now, we tested it to the extreme. Okay, 4, 5 dB. Now, someone mentioned the other day that dB being exponential, okay, we know that 3 dB is a doubling, okay, in the sound pressure or the uh, intensity, right? Okay, so 5 dB, well, that's, that's, that's nearly a, you know, a four-fold increase. That's a big deal, right? Okay. Yes, no. Who says yes? Yes. Is 4 dB a big deal? Depends upon the application. We're talking bearings. Is 4 dB a big deal? Come on, I'm going to rule a line in the sand here. Not a big deal. 4 dB, is it a big deal or not? Who says yes? Who says no? Everyone else, get out because you're not listening. I said I'm drawing a line in the sand. That means you're on one side or the other, you sit on the fence, you're out the door. 4 dB is no big deal, right? Okay. Now, that means we might want to set our lubrication alarm at maybe 10 or 12 dB as opposed to 8, right? Okay. Now, on the other hand, if criticality is an issue, what are you going to do? Lower your first one, widen your top one. You might say, well, look, we're going to leave it at 8. And we're going to accept that every now and again we're going to get a false positive. Right. Is that a bad thing? No. You get there with a grease gun and you're going to be using your grease caddy. Okay, that's, that's, a free, that's a free advert for you, Gary. I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> okay, you're going to get there and he's going to have his grease caddy. He's going to be greasing. He starts putting some grease in and nothing happens to the DB. What's he going to do? Okay. Was the false positive of such a bad deal? Okay, well, it all depends whether he used his grease caddy and whether he was paying attention, right? <laughs> Otherwise, he's just destroyed that thing. Okay. Variation in speed had marginally greater effect on the dB level on the application or driven end. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay, varies a little bit depending on the application. And the key qualifying statement here, people, the key qualifying statement is it does depend very much on the application. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, can we deal with that variable? Is that a variable we can deal with? Okay. As long as we know and we're taking a bit extra time to set up our baseline, not a problem. Okay, then just down the bottom there, okay, we got the potential, okay, um, for our actual implant usage bands to be quite narrow. Okay, which means we can trend this thing no trouble at all. Okay, now what we did is we said, well, okay, we did all these tests at 30 kilohertz. Okay, now Chuck said he did his testing at, at 25, right? Where's Chuck? Where's Chuck? You use 25, right? Yep, okay. So what we did is we said, look, let's vary the test frequency a little. Does this change as we are? Because remember with ultrasound, we want to be able to change the test frequency, right? Why do we want to do that? Get the best sound or to be able to tune out some other annoying sound. Kind of like having someone sit next to you and talk when you're trying to listen. Because you're all trying to listen, right? Let me try that again. You're all trying to listen, right? <laughs> okay, just as long as we've got that clear. All right, so let's go with the, um, this is back to the smart pump. You'll see the motor outboard. Um, where are we? Okay, you notice we've got a spike at one particular, um, one particular speed at the 24 kilohertz, okay? And that sort of comes through a little bit. But other than that, okay, everything's actually looking pretty good. It's pretty consistent. Okay, so what can we conclude from that? For that application, right? So this is where, you know, you're going to have to be a little bit careful. Okay, but generally we found we'd, we tested across the board, 30 seemed pretty good, and plenty of leeway either side, but there's an occasion where you do need to be a little bit careful. Okay, if we come back over here, you look at the other bearings. Um, anyone have anything stick out at you there? Does anything jump out? Kind of pop trend 
looks like the lower frequencies kind of trend up. Yep, okay. Now, is that an issue? Not a, I would say no if you stick with the same frequency. If you stick to the same frequency, right? Yeah. You had a question there, Chuck? Oh. 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 Okay. All right, let's jump along to the next one. The pulp screen. Okay, remember I said the motor was pretty flat? It was pretty flat for each frequency. That's just to give you an idea of the spread there. Okay, you'll notice though that when you get to the driven end, the pump end, see what happens? So this is where we need to start being a little bit careful. You need to understand, okay, coming back to level one here, what do we need to understand? Acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria, and that comes in two parts. We need to understand what? What's our resolutions again? Our inspector resolution, what's the other one? Come on. What equipment? Our equipment resolution, okay. We need to make sure and we need to document. We can't have someone that likes to test at 25 kilohertz and then the next guy comes along and says, oh, I do all my bearings at 30 kilohertz. What's going to happen? Okay. We need to be especially careful. Okay. Okay. Water flow. Okay. Now, remember how those two lines I put up there before were quite flat? Okay. But then when we hit a sweet spot over here, Okay, and this one was at 28 kilohertz. Okay, there was a frequency there. We hit that frequency and boom, at the right speed, had a little blip. So these are sort of the things that can come out. Okay, so we need to be a little bit aware of these things. Okay, and then the air heater, same scenario. Okay, so in summary, ultrasound levels trend higher, okay, as we drop the test frequency. Once again, is that a big deal? Okay. Provided what? Documentation, right? Okay. Okay, DB level relatively stable, okay, particularly on the motor bearings, okay, and it depends a little on the application as to how, how variable that is. Okay. Do we have any questions at this point in time? What do you think? Do you have any idea what accounted for the spikes? Any, any uh, clue what accounted for the spikes at some frequency? Um, not at this stage. It's something we're going to do a little bit more work to sort of play around with, partly because we can. Exactly. Um, the, the great thing about doing this in the lab is we can play around with these things, we can do all sorts of things, and we're not stuffing up someone's production. You know, and we can test things to the limits. Um, you know, so, yeah, we're going we're to look into this a little bit more detail. Um, but, but yeah, no, nothing, nothing that we're aware of at this stage. Yeah. Just, we just put it down to this, obviously something happening at that speed, at that frequency where you're getting something. Yep. that frequency over others. Yep. 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 Now, we, what we've done is we did, what you're not seeing is when we did these tests, we did a lot of tests that we went up in one, one kilohertz increments. And we, we've, we've done a lot of extra tests, but to make these graphs easy to read, you could imagine if we just had 100 curves on that thing, you just sort of look at it and it's like, well, that looks like breakfast. Yesterday's breakfast, probably. Um, so, yes, I know that this, this, this is more testing that we can do. Anyone else? Did you vary the modules that you used with both magnetic and contact? And did that have any effect? Um, good question. Good question. Did everyone get that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you're doing this, can you switch modules? No. Hang on. Look. Can you switch modules? No. Okay. You cannot trend with two different modules under no circumstances. Okay. Is there anyone that's not clear on that? Down here. Can you not just create two scenarios and then have, I'm going to trend this with a magnetic probe and that's going to be machine B magnetic and this is going to be machine B contact? You could. You could. Um, now, for me personally, I could deal with that. But as, as Mark always tells me, we've got to make things simple so the lowest common denominator at the plant can deal with it. 
Okay. And so although, you know, you or I, or, you know, most of us in the room here, we can probably deal with that. The problem is, is one day you're sick. Okay. Or, you know, you get hit by a bus and you're not back again. Um, you know, um, so, I mean, in principle, yes, you can. Okay. You can set up all sorts of offsets and everything else. Actually, you can also do alarms the same way. You can yep. say, at 24 yep. kilohertz, this is my alarm. I'm yep. Yep. At that. yep. But my attitude with all these things, and I know this sounds crazy coming from someone that's sort of based at university, you know, let's drill it down, keep it as simple as possible. Okay, you know, just to finish off here, what we're now doing is this has moved to the implant implementation stage. So what we've done... Oh, sorry. I'll try again. Um, because it didn't... If I use a contact stethoscope module... Yes. ...consistently... Yes. ...and I use a magnet, I understand that. Yes. Consistently. Yes. On the results, did either one of those vary more or less than the other? No. Okay. No. No. Nope. I'd be very concerned if they did. James, which module did you use just for reference? Um, the different machines, we use different modules. So we've done testing with both modules. Okay, but what we've done... So, like, remember I mentioned we've done a whole lot of testing? I'm just sort of trying to keep this simple because the last thing I want is someone to get a copy of these slides to sort of learn about it and have them go off doing something and, and then have Gary or someone call me up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and start abusing me because I've given someone a, 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 a wrong, wrong instruction. Um, okay, so... <laughs> is that all right? Is that all right? Okay. So, yeah, so what we're doing now is we've, we've started a program in the plant, okay, where we've got all these various applications listed there, pumps, fans, evaporator fans, MVR fans, freezers, VST air compressors, all the rest of it, where we've got a monitoring program that's now been put in place. Now granted, to get any real decent quality data, we're going to have to have this thing run for a few years, yeah? And what we've now got up and running, everything's coming along nicely, okay? Um, one thing I will point out, one particular application that is you're going to have to be very, very careful if you do this is the VSD compressor. The dB values on the, uh, on the air ends vary dramatically with the load on the compressor. Okay? But the great thing about a VSD air compressor is you can look on the machine and it can tell you what the RPM is. So you know, on those particular applications you're going to have to be a little bit more careful but once again you can have a baseline based on speed so you, you end up with a baseline curve rather than just a point. Okay, so you can still do it, but what I'm saying is, is for certain applications, you have to be careful. Okay. Okay, so what are we measuring? Well, we're measuring dB using the Ultra Probe 10,000. Now, Gary, I would love to do this testing with an Ultra Probe 15,000. Okay, we're measuring motor speed as well, recording sound files. Okay, ultimately, what is our objective, uh, our objective here? We want to have a traffic light system. Green's good, red, alarm. Am you, you say amber or yellow over here? Either or, it's yellow though. We say yellow, but I, d I threw the amber in because I had a vague recollection that you guys do different. Everything's different over here, so. <laughs> okay, um, now the whole point of... Um, of the amber is, okay, if we need to go out and recheck, we can. Now remember, if that's a lubrication alarm, you get out there and you just got to make sure that the guys doing the recheck are or the gun, rather than just going out there with a the grease gun, right? Okay, the end of the day is what we want to do is we're trying to keep it simple. If we keep it simple, then it's going to be successful. Any program that's going to be successful has to be simple. Okay, um, I guess the, the, the other thing is, is if, if you look at it and you sort of say, well, okay, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure about the speed. You can always fall back on just, well, hang on a minute, what am I hearing? You know, it's like Chuck, Chuck's already done a great job talking about this this morning. You know, first thing, just stop and think about what I'm hearing, you know. Does that bearing sound like it's good? Or does it sound like it's bad? You know, I mean, always, you know. You shouldn't just be relying on the instrument. You should be relying on you, you know. Your company spent plenty of money sending you along to all these great training courses and programs, this conference. You know, it should be so that you, as an individual, can say, hey, no, that doesn't sound right. Okay? I need to recheck that anyway. Okay? 
that should always be, you know, sort of that first filter to say, hang on, I need to check that. Okay, at the end of the day, I've already sort of talked about this, but it comes down to setting your alarm levels. You can set those alarm levels based on what your degree of criticality is. And you can have now with DMS that variable alarm levels depending on your lubrication. I mean, you've set it up just so it can be straight into VST bearing carry. Well done. Um, and that's basically it. Um, so I guess to finish off, how are you going to implement this in your plant? Who thinks they could go and implement this in their plant? <coughs> Who's got a plant? <laughs> how many people have we got in here that's actually got a plant to go and do something in? We've got a few? Yeah? Okay. Do you think this is something you could do? Thank you. Any questions? See, this may be a dumb question, but compared to, I have, I'm pretty I sure this is the last slide, yeah. The FBs in Canada. Variable frequency drives? Yes. It's the same thing. And that's what I wanted to ask. Would this really translate the same way? Variable frequency drive is a variable speed drive. They're all pretty much used the same electronics. There's only about two or three manufacturers of the electronics globally. There's even been a lot of rationalisation in the manufacturers of the VSDs as well. Um, same sort of technology. Um, I used to work for one of those companies. Um, if I haven't really had it in this presentation. I've had a couple of questions already this morning. If any of you um, have questions about variable speed drives and other implications, why not? I'll be happy to um, go through some things a little later. I'm conscious of the time now. But certainly later on, if you've got questions, we'll certainly deal with them um, in that regard. Um, any other questions relating to the bearings? James, we'll be back here this afternoon for uh, another presentation, so you'll have plenty of time to ask questions about I'm sure he'll be happy to answer about this and the ones later, too. I believe we're right on time. Now, right on the money. I'm amazed. Thank you.